All right, back to uh, regular scheduled programming here, 1300. DHS, J.D. Henry. Let it go, Mike. <laughs> All right. All right, thank you so much. All right, everybody. Uh, so, yeah, I am J.D. Henry. I'm with the Department of Homeland Security, Cyber Security and Infrastructure Security Agency here. Um, it's a uh, relatively new agency. We were part of the National Programs and Protections Directorate prior to November of last year. Um, based off the threats and, and the profiling that have been coming down and some of the recent events, uh, they went ahead and they finally started to put resources behind critical infrastructure. Uh, and that's where this agency really comes from. It's going to focus mostly on the physical uh, security pieces as well as the cyber pieces. And I am a wonderer, so I'm sorry if that's distracting anybody, but I'll be walking around as I talk. Um, so, quick show of hands, just so I can gauge the audience, how many people here are part of a critical infrastructure sector? See a couple, a few more up here. Alright, so, for the rest of you, this may not be the most interesting topic you've seen today, unfortunately, but uh, we are doing some neat things and there are some resources that you can use uh, as well, but most of what I'm going to be talking about today is going to be geared towards what we provide critical infrastructure sectors. Cybersecurity Advisor, the program itself, the offerings, uh, some of the protections we provide for the information that we, uh, we gather as we go through these assessments, the services for both what I provide, what our teams in Arlington and Pensacola provide as far as technical assistance, and then some training awareness and reporting pieces. So, unfortunately, I know that not everybody's part of critical infrastructure, but that bottom line, uh, that training awareness and reporting is something that everybody's able to utilize. slide. So, so uh, the program itself for uh, system and our CSAs. Um, we are not, as I was uh, talking to Mike about, we are not Beltway individuals. Um, we are in beds within the communities. You see a map here of where we're at. There's about 20 of us right now that are located throughout the country. Uh, we are part of your local community's infrastructure, so we get to build partnerships, and that's what they are. We don't have clientele. We don't have anything as far as relationships as far as there's a cost associated. Everything that we provide is absolutely no cost. Uh, everything is already paid for up front by your taxes. I encourage everybody to keep paying their taxes so we can keep providing these services. Um, but we do provide that regional presence to be able to go through. So not only so for the response and recovery piece, but as well we also provide a lot of services for the preparation, the awareness, and preparedness so that makes yourself a harder target towards the attacks if an incident were to occur. A lot of words on the screen again, uh, some of the program activities to summarize what it is, everything I kind of just said as far as cyber preparedness, risk mitigation, incident and, incident, uh, incident and information coordination, um, well, as well as we're going to go through these assessments. Uh, it may look a little bit familiar to some people if anybody has had any experience with Carnegie Mellon University in the past and their RMM, their, their risk management, or risk maturity models. Um, there's a lot of different flavors of what they do. Uh, Homeland Security has been contracting out with them for some time through a lot of our assessments as well. Uh, the model is pretty sound. It's been proven. It's been in existence for almost two decades now. So uh, it's been adapted here for critical infrastructure purposes. So you'll see that as we go through, uh, and then as well as the working groups uh, for state and local partnerships. Again, I said that we work mostly with critical infrastructure. I uh, failed to ask, is there any state, local, tribal governments representative here or anybody who has affiliation with? Okay. So those are also partners that we maintain as well. Here's where we're at. So I am sitting right there. These are divided up by FEMA regions. So if you ever wondered what FEMA region Iowa resides in, if there was anything, you're in Region 7. Uh, so I, along with Jeff, or your FEMA and uh, your responders for cybersecurity uh, on that FEMA region. Um, this number should, these maps should get some more dots on it hopefully next year. Uh, willing that we have a budget and they don't have to go to another government shutdown, the plan last year was to put about 30 more dots. So our program's only been in existence for about four to five years now. 
uh, what we're going to be doing here is a lot of the major cities, coastals are going to get a lot. But there's also going to be, you'll see some, some major gaps, yes, especially in the southeast, uh, right around the uh, Region 5, Chicago, Lake, Lake, Lakeland area. Uh, they'll get some more as well. And this is where we're at. Uh, we are the advisors that are here in the embeds that I spoke to. So if you need anything as far as federal assistance, whether or not you belong to critical infrastructure or not, you're, we are your local embeds that you can reach out to, and we can tie you into other services, help you get through a, a bad day if you're having one. Uh, we work very closely with FBI, Secret Service, uh, even some of the local law enforcement. So we have a lot of resources that we can be able to throw at you if you're in need of help. All right, so if you didn't understand the first question, um, what we define as critical infrastructure, this is what the federal government designed it, uh, defined it as. Um, the one that you'll see on there that I just, it's a subsector that I chose under government facilities, which is the election infrastructure. Uh, that's something that has become a hot topic, but we support that as well. So with the here being in Iowa, I think that's always a, a nice thing to bring out because they were starting as early as February here, I believe, with the caucuses. So we've been, uh, I spent a lot of time in Des Moines uh, with the Secretary of State's office. Uh, when we're coming up with plans and actions and, and exercises to make sure that everything's smooth and we have a, uh, a smooth election cycle going forward. Uh, but everything else up there, I, I like to focus on mostly lifeline sectors. I spend a lot of time with water, power, healthcare, uh, some of our riverways uh, for the lots of dam systems that are on there. Um, obviously, I don't spend a lot of time on some of the others that are, uh, they're not applicable, like some of the port cities and things like that. Um, we don't have a whole lot of ports here, uh, other than the, the river ports. Um, but even that, that, this is what we're defining as, and this is where we spend most of our time supporting. And this can be interactive too, so if anybody has a question at any time, please feel free to raise your hand. Sir. So everything that we do aligns to NIST cybersecurity framework. So a lot of our stuff has mapping to the, the, the framework itself. So a lot of our stuff, uh, we've already made crosswalks. And you can go through Google's crosswalks. As far as the 800 series, no? Oh, NIST. I'm sorry, I heard NIST. <laughs> So our uh, national cybersecurity uh, protection plans and all that, you'll see that our presidential policy directives, uh, they all do tie in. This is how Congress uh, goes through to be able to allocate our funding based off those plans that are developed in the national cybersecurity strategies. Uh, those all come into play. Uh, again, as us regional guys, we try to stay away out of the Beltway politics on all that. Uh, we usually do more of the actual data collection to be able to go up facilitate so what those decisions are going to look like, what that's going to shape into, so they can present that to Congress, and then Congress can make decisions on how they're going to allocate funding, how they're going to put it, which sectors they're going to focus on. Does that help answer your question? Now, is, is there a direct correlation? Um, there could be, and I can actually find that out for you if you'd like to see that. Alright. So, and one of the themes that we're going to talk about here is we talked about that awareness, preparedness, to be able to help make yourself a harder target against being uh, attacked or, or being a victim. But really, what my focus is more is, is not so much uh, the actual security pieces, it's the resiliency side. And your organization is going to go on any, undergo any number of stressors. It doesn't have to be a, a black hoodie guy in a basement, you know, shooting packets and trying to knock down your, your, your servers. It could be flooding, as we've seen here in Iowa here in the past. Uh, tornadoes, there's, there's any number of stressors that you can go through. So what we want to do is be able to make sure that you have plans, that you've been able to exercise and mature, to be able to get back to a normal operating state as quick as possible. Uh, attacks are going to happen, they're going to change, they're going to come in all shapes and different forms. Um, so what, we can, what can we do is we can exercise that what is going to happen, when, how we're going to react when something like that happens. And do we have a plan? It's much easier to follow a plan if you've got one. Uh, and it's not on the server that you, 
that's now currently you know, locked up and you can't access. Uh, so, so we'll talk about a lot of those things as we go through our assessment. So, as I mentioned, I am from Homeland Security. I am part of the federal government. Why would anybody want to share any information with the federal government they weren't obligated to? We are invitation only. Uh, we can only come to your door if you ask us to, unless you are a state, local, or tribal uh, entity, and then we can actually cold call you as an elected official. Um, but for the rest of those sectors, we can't just come in and kick the door down and start asking questions. We're not auditors, we're not regulators, we have no authority whatsoever. I can't even tell you that you need to implement anything or make recommendations for you to implement anything, which makes me a terrible advisor, but uh, I can give you options for consideration. Uh, and that's what our lawyers tell us that we have to provide, because if you were to say that, well, they told us we had to do this and it still got packed, that means we get brought into the actual legal and litigations and lawsuits as well. So we have to be very careful on how we tread and where, what, what verbiage and wording we use when we actually tell you, well, these are the best practices in the industry and these are options you should consider implementing to make sure you're more resilient to an attack. So when you share information with us, it is protected as long as it's critical infrastructure under the Protected Critical Infrastructure Act of 2002. What that does is that anything you share with the federal government that has to do with your utility or your government office, we have to protect it under criminal penalties. So if I was a third party person coming in as a security consultant, we would sign a non-disclosure agreement. Um, if I were to leak your information or I would fail to do my due diligence to protect it, we would go to court, there would be a civil litigation, you would sue me, I'd pay fines. Here instead, I just going to go to federal prison. Um, so there's a strong, uh, a strong reason for us to be able to take that information and make sure that it's protected. Uh, that also supersedes Freedom of Information Act requests, uh, any state, local sunshine laws that had a uh, had disclosures, as well as the use of civil litigation. If somebody were to get hurt, they knew that you had done these assessments. They can't use those as subpoenas or court of law. In summarizing, that's, that's what all those words say. There's a lot of words, I'm sure. So the advisors themselves, here's what I do for all of my partners. First one is called a infrastructure survey. Uh, it is a very tactical level, uh, controls-based assessment. It's interview-based, we're gonna sit down and we're gonna talk about how you do controls under five domains. Uh, apologize if you can't read that, uh, but the five domains in the right-hand corner are what we're gonna go through and talk. It's mostly going to cover about your personnel, how you manage things, how you manage your, uh, your incident response programs, the dependencies you have, as well as uh, some of the actual management activities. Most of the things we see are technical based. They're actually procedurally based and the threat exposure rates that we see a lot of our partners have are because they do practices poorly, not because they have poor technical limitations of equipment. They have firewalls, they just don't do a very good job of managing them or that they have uh, you know, the capability to do strong network segmentation, but it's become kind of a hindrance on the actual organization to be able to maintain that logical separation of different entities and to still be able to operate. So this is something that we're going to talk about reoccurringly throughout all the assessments. It's very process and procedural based, uh, but uh, making these implementations are also very low cost for many organizations. Uh, and, uh, you can actually really exponentially reduce your exposure to attacks just by implementing good processes, and we've seen this, I can't even tell you how many times, but it, it's, uh, it's something that if I'm asking you to spend a lot of money to be able to go through and try to secure your network, we need to get cut off because we've had too much to drink. Uh, mostly when we talk, we're going to talk about how to fix, put in policies, enforce policies, and procedures, and enforce those be able to, to improve your security. So what this looks like at the end, the deliverable is a dashboard. The dashboard takes and puts you in a high, low watermark uh, against you and your peers. So we don't collect information or share your information. We will collect demographics so we compare you to peers. So whether or not you're an organization that services this many people, that has an IT staff in this much, you'll be compared to similar organizations. 
uh, and you'll see the high, medium, and low. What you'll also be able to do is start doing war gaming and table topping with it. If you look up top right, you'll see that you can put in different types of stressor situations like natural disaster, uh, I think uh, remote malware, remote access, denial of service. There's, there's several others that are on there that aren't listed. Um, and then uh, you can also say where should we invest? And the bars move as you start putting in these variables. So you can use this as decision-based, which is why I say it's so tactical in nature. It's not something you're going to present to higher level leadership or board because they're going to try to figure out how do I get to that green mark. And that's really not what the tool is designed to do. It's, designed, it's more designed to design, uh, drive decision making. So the five domains I talked about, it'll also do the same thing. So you have your overall aggregate. I'm going to break it down for each different domain. Uh, just a, new, a different view, uh, same different type of scenarios and table topping that you can do against each one of those as well. And that was the uh, Cybersecurity Infrastructure Survey, or CIS. A lot of people, oh, sorry. So the question was uh, about the 16 different sectors and the energy sector specifically, whether or not they were utilizing this more than others. The answer is no. Um, and there's a reason why. And the explanation is, is that they are extremely regulated by NERC. So NERC, our National um, Energy Reliance Corporation, um, under FERC, federal entity. I, if you know anybody in the energy sector that does cybersecurity, you go home and say a prayer for them. The NERC website should have a crisis hotline number, they should have support groups. What they do for their NERC SIP regulatory uh, compliance mechanisms is absolutely horrendous. It is, in my opinion, it becomes counterproductive to cybersecurity. So depending on whether or not you're generating power, you're transmitting power, or whether or not you're just distributing power, it puts you into several categories. If you violate NERC SIP regulations, and you can have up to 14 different, well, it goes up to SIP 14, but we don't have SIP 1, and we don't have SIP 9. So there's, there's about 12 different regulations. You can be subject to penalties of per day, per occurrence, for each, for each violation. Can't say the particular vendor, but if you look up your smartphones, they are publicly traded, so they had to report. But one vendor just recently was fined over ten million dollars, and they should have been ecstatic that that number was as low as it was. That was a settlement offer. So there's a huge amount of risk they undertake by implementing stronger cybersecurity controls outside of what they're required to. They require additional cybersecurity, or if they if they do implement it, they're now subject to being audited off those controls if it's part of their SIP plan. Again, the regulation and the way we do things can sometimes be counterproductive, but energy is one of those. Um, and I digress greatly, I'm sorry, but that is one of the things that we commonly get. We are invite only. And energy is one of those folks that well, we really understand what you're saying, but you have to be empathetic to our situation. And if we were to go through and implement these, this is the situation of the risk that management, we have to explain, try to get management to it and say, well, I accept that risk. And a lot of times, if you can bankrupt the corporation and the company, the answer is no, do what you have to do, and that's it. So the feds to leave. But, Um, the next one we do as well is the external dependencies. So with managed service providers, with cloud service providers, and the trend for people taking uh, off-premise data, um, we went ahead, all of our assessments will address external dependencies in one way or another, uh, but there was a, it was a very low performance sector, so Carnegie Mellon went ahead and created a brand new um, assessment here. And it's going to assess pretty much three different areas. I think you are on the next slide if I put them on there. But 
three areas it's going to address are how you enter into relationships with third parties. The agreements, the service level agreements that you entered, the contracts, however it is, what are the steps that you would take and what are the considerations you made when entering into that relationship. Uh, the second domain is once you're in it, how do you hold that vendor accountable, that contractor accountable for the things that they asked you to do. Um, so if they're at four hour response times and they're breaking them, well, what are you doing about that? How are you managing that relationship? And then the final one is how would you egress from that, situ from that situation, that relationship, if they were not meeting those service level agreements or contracts, or if they just ceased to go away and they were smoking black crater, or underneath you know, a couple feet of water, how, well, do you have a plan to be able to recover your operations when your third party dependency say it's power? Everybody's dependency, everybody's dependent on power. Uh, you have a data center um, and power goes out, how long are your generators going to last? Who's your fuel supplier? Can you get there? So there's a lot of different scenarios. We take it a lot of different directions. We look at three different areas. We look at your suppliers, we look at your contractors, your vendors. We look at your government infrastructure uh, providers as far as your fire, police, um, emergency services, and then we look at actually the telecoms as well, so the infrastructure side. Output for this one, the deliverable, it's a fairly lengthy report with options to consider. And again, there's crosswalks. Every single question is identified, uh, the maturity levels that you're going to reach, and it's going to tell you where you can go through and reference in several different documents. Most of them are missed uh, on how to go through and make implementations to improve your area of that service. And then the last one we do is the, the biggest one. Uh, this one takes about a full day to do, where the other two take about half a day. This is the Cyber Resilience Review. That's 10 different domains. This one is something that everybody can go out and look at. Um, the other two I have to come in and do, but this box here in the middle, the CQ Voluntary Program website, you can go and actually download the CRR and do self-assessment. So you can conduct this one yourself. Um, if you want help doing it, you can always give me a call. Uh, I'll give you my contact number after. Uh, there's a slide with that that I encourage everybody to take a picture of. But this assessment does take about six to eight hours to conduct if you do it correctly. Um, there's 10 different domains that you're going to go through. The, the biggest one being asset management because everything else hinges on what assets you have deployed. A lot of times what we find out is people don't even know what's in their network. So how are you managing? How can I do security? How can I do other change management, configuration management, if I don't even know what's out there? So we focus a lot of time on asset management. And uh, it's, uh, it's usually pretty shocking to the organization if you're not who's in the room because we get very different answers from management than we do from the actual security team than we do from the actual IT operations team. So once you start seeing and nobody has a full picture, we a lot of times see that nobody has a full picture of what's really going on. Okay. So those ones are all what I do. Um, they are all, all interview based. We're going to sit down and we're going to talk and we're going to talk a lot about theory and academia and, and processes and procedures, um, all really boring stuff. Uh, the NCATS team gets to have all the fun. Um, they are the ones who actually come in and do the on-site physical assessments. And the first one that they do is, with a lot of words on the screen, all that is is Nessus scanning. So uncredentialed external Nessus scanning of your IP space that's forward-facing to the internet. Uh, they will give you a weekly report of what your critical high, medium, lows are, along with the normal Nessus CVE type instructions on how to either mitigate or remediate those reports. Uh, those will come through every Monday. Uh, a lot of people find them useful if you're already doing credential internal scanning or you're doing these scannings and you're having a third party do it. This is something that's a no cost charge and uh, DHS will provide it for you as well. If you haven't seen the Nessus report, they're nice and colorful, management likes them. IT people usually hate them because it doesn't tell you, it doesn't give you a lot of room to explain why you're not patching. It doesn't give you a lot of space to say, well, it breaks everything else we're doing, boss, so yeah, we didn't patch it. It's been on there for four and a half months, we understand that. But it does drive the conversation of, 
do we have a plan on how we're actually putting other controls in place while we're trying to figure out how we can patch it? So, again, I would recommend having your management staff request this or receive this. Vision campaigns. This is a fun one. Uh, we'll get a trusted agent from your organization. Uh, we'll start developing a, we'll put you part of a campaign. The organization will fish you for six weeks. Uh, there's going to be varying levels of complexity on the actual fishing itself. So one will be very high number of indicators compromised, uh, Nigerian Prince type scenario. And then some of them will only have a single indicator where you're going to have to mouse over and see that, well, it's not actually going to the URL that it's actually listed. So it's going to test, uh, test your employees and your organization's resiliency to phishing attempts, which is where we see a lot of our actual I say a lot, but I say most of our actual breaches are coming from uh, the initial vector was always tied back to fishing. The report on this one is kind of neat. Um, it'll tell you who clicked, how fast they clicked. The guys are your serial clickers, or the natural board clickers that were actually trying to troubleshoot and open it up in different browsers and download it to different devices and really try to get a document or a link to open. Um, so it'll give, give you an idea of uh, where you need to focus the most training at. Sure. So the question is, are employees of these organizations upset that they're tricked into doing this? Uh, so a lot of it has to do with policy. Um, is there acceptable use policy on the network? Do you accept, uh, do you consent to monitoring? Those are company assets that you're facing and you're going to, you're going to target the company assets. I would never ask you to put your employees' personal emails on here. Um, we would be violating a number of laws. Uh, but on company resources and the assets that you own, and hopefully there's a policy in place to be able to say that they were operating under that policy. Uh, some people are. And organizations handle this very differently. Some take the carrot, some actually take a very large stick approach to how they deal with employees and being able to react to real phishing attempts. Um, a lot of people use know before, another free service that's out. Uh, I don't promote any services, by the way, but this is just one that a recent customer said we use this, and after five attempts, we terminate employee. And it's written into every single one. So they take a stick approach. Uh, another one has said that, well, we have a button that we employed that's report fishing. And the division that has the most reports of the actual fishing, we go ahead and reward them. And there's usually some kind of gift or time off or pizza party or something. So they take a very careful approach. Uh, again, it's up to the organization how much risk they're willing to take, what the business nature is, how critical that debt is, and how much impact we can cause. If they, were, uh, if they were hit by something that really I could interrupt operations. So, all those words to say, it depends. Right? <laughs> um, for our ICS customers that, uh, that are trying to figure out whether or not their network is designed correctly, our Idaho National Labs folks have come out and do what they call the Vader. Uh, really what they're looking at here is the actual architectural design, traffic flows, they'll give you a lot of inputs on how to be able to improve that. They're not going to touch your network in any way, they're going to ask you to provide all this and sit down with your engineers and they're going to discuss all your system logs, your network logs, the actual design and the, uh, the network architecture. But they'll come out with a, uh, it's, it's really pretty much just a consultancy uh, that's coming out for ICS uh, specifically. So yes, yeah, we are all cleared individuals uh, from Idaho National Labs, cybersecurity advisors. We all carry uh, federal clearances. And we're all TSSCI cleared. The the neat one that most people get really excited about is the actual pit test. They call it the risk vulnerability analysis. Um, they will come out uh, and do a full scale pit test. It usually takes about two weeks. The first week is they're going to be the reconnaissance phases. Um, and then after that, they'll start going in and they'll, they'll come on site and they'll actually start deploying 
tactics to be able to get in. Uh, very similar to what we see in the adversarial world. Um, they'll start taking screenshots, they'll show you how they got in, what they did. Um, we share a lot of information and resources with other federal partnerships, so the guys are actually really good at what they do. Uh, but most of what they're going to use is what's in the wild. They're not going to hit you with some undefendable zero day or anything like that. It's going to be software that you can get out of GitHub or anywhere else. So it's stuff that you should be able to defend. They're not going to be so sneaky that they, they want to test your defenders and make sure that they're, uh, they're able to detect a lot of the things they're doing. So it won't be so covert that it's not NSA coming in and sitting on your network for three years before they tell you what they did. They're going to come in with normal tactics. Um, most of what you're going to see here is going to be uh, an idea of what they're going to be doing while they're on site. Right. So anybody, okay, so we already said that there was no state employees, local employees, um, veterans in the room? Great. Uh, federal, state, local, and veterans have access to FedBTE. It's about 136 different courses. Uh, there's 800 some odd hours of training, and they're very well kept up to date. I just saw they updated Certified Ethical Hacker to version 10. Um, they had another course that just showed up there called Cyber Dark Arts. I'm not sure what that is, but I'm going to check that one out. Uh, but there's, there's a lot of different coursework on there. As far as cybersecurity, it's, it's free if you can get in off uh, one of those. You'll just put in the email, put in your official email, uh, or go through a vet. You may ask you to see like DD214 or something, but they'll let you in and have access to all that training. Stop Think Connect for, for everybody else it is one of those sites to where we actually go through and try to say secure the human or secure the home. Um, you'll see that there's going to be toolkits on here. You'll see that we can target those toolkits. So if you have young children and you want to be able to understand, you want them to be able to understand dangers on the internet, they're all very focused towards that. Um, they also keep them much shorter. Uh, even for adults, we say like optimal training times like three minutes, and that's when you probably somebody stops reading and you lose them. So they go through and they make everything tailored to the actual group. Older Americans, so anybody with parents or anybody who's subject to social security scams, uh, your nephews in a Tijuana prison right now. Um, so they, they focus in on a lot of that, um, as well as like small businesses as well. And then again, there's, there's, if you can navigate through these, I'll say that one thing that I, uh, I won't promote is we don't make everything as easy to find on these pages as we can, but there is a ton of resources on here outside just the snapshots you're seeing. So, so play around on the page, you'll find a lot of good things. Uh, Cybersecurity Awareness is next month, everybody's excited about that. Um, DHS has been the sponsor of Cybersecurity Awareness Month since it was incepted in 2002. Uh, this will be the first year that it's doing it under the moniker of CISA. So they've been trying to go all out, so we're going to see what this one's going to look like. Uh, Everybody's got pretty high expectations. Last year's, you'll see the themes there, they're still available. So if you want to go ahead and start pulling off all the posters, the flyers, the documents, um, that was the themes from last year. I think 2017 is still up as well. So you go pull all those down, start posting them on all the walls, uh, get ready, and start planning cybersecurity awareness, and uh, all your themes that you're going to do for the local organization in October. So, incident reporting. If you were to go out and do an incident, I hope nobody ever does, that they have to go through a report. Um, the NKIC, which is our operations center, I'll show you a picture of that here in a second. They're located in uh, Arlington, I believe. Uh, they can go through and they can start looking at, and they can coordinate incident response and recovery, whether or not it's with Title 18, FBI, local law enforcement. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're part of credit equipment structure. Uh, you can call that number and they will help you through. They will open up a ticket that they will track and they will start trying to get you resources you need to be able to get back on your feet. Uh, a lot of times we're asked when to report as soon as possible. Um, if it's financial fraud, I mean, the FBI has certain things they can do. If it's wire fraud, they can initiate a kill chain process, but it has to be within 72 hours. So. 
most times people will report when they've run out of options and resources. And a lot of times, the, a lot of the mechanisms we have in place to be able to recover some of those, uh, some of those losses have already passed. Uh, it, it's unfortunate. Uh, if you're part of critical infrastructure, when you call the FBI, they will try to help you best they can because they have a limited kill chain to be able to interact. After that, they're in it for criminal prosecution. Uh, if you're part of critical infrastructure, you can call us. We will go through the hunt incident response team. We can actually be, we're a little bit more resourced to be able to go through and get you back on your feet from the recovery piece. The HURT team, uh, this is kind of what they do. They will do a lot of the actual malware analysis, a lot of the actual forensics. Um, they will try to get you back to where your network is in a trusted state. Sometimes, uh, if it's ransomware and things like that, there, there aren't a lot of options and you can't recover keys. Uh, but they will come out uh, either remotely or they will come on site and they'll, uh, they'll go through and help you through those uh, the right side of the boom type incidents. Skipped over a slide. This is the end kick. Uh, it's now called the PSYOC, so I apologize that I haven't updated the slide yet. PSYOC, with any reorganization, a new organization, everything's changing. Like I said, we have, we're not even a year old yet, so we haven't even learned how to mismanage our budget so far. But uh, with PSYOC, they were, for your convenience, it was the CISA Integrated Operations Coordination Center. So they embedded an acronym within the acronym. So if you have to sit there like me in front of your mirror, it's the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency Integrated Operations Coordination Center. So they were uh, they were kind to me in that way. Uh, but this is the actual uh, the building itself. Uh, on here, so it's not only Homeland Security and system personnel. We have representation from DOD, uh, CIA Cyber Command, Joint Force Headquarters, Doden. We have three letter agencies like the FBI, CIA, U.S. Secret Service. A lot of the ISACs sit on here. Um, but uh, a lot of information sharing. A lot of information sharing going on. It's done at a uh, TS environment, so they can share everything. One thing about Homeland Security is if it's able to be shared, we don't have a whole, a whole lot of intel gain lost questions. We don't want December 23rd Ukraine activity where black energy is shutting down power grids. Uh, there's not a whole lot for us to gain out of that. So we will share that information out. Uh, if your members can you get into an ISAC, uh, I encourage it. That's how a lot of that threat information is passed. Uh, if you can get it with the local info, info guards from your FBI offices, uh, they also take a lot of that information and pass it along as well. So threat intel is one of those things that's very difficult to get into or it can be very expensive to get into. So I encourage those free organizations to partner with DHS because a lot of that is generated in this room right here. And this room extends just as far in the other direction and around the corner. It's a pretty large facility. So, so the question is, is, do they have classified phones that you can call into, whether or not it's a SDE, which negotiates to a higher level classification off an that initiates off an unclassified line, or whether or not they have secure lines like fibers they can auto negotiate. The, the answer to that is to call that number and to ask them because they will uh, they will provide you an environment to be able to go into to be able to do that. So the call center will operate off that number and then they will direct you to the office, whether or not it's the herd, whether or not it's in cats, and then they will get you to the line that you actually need to speak on. Uh, everything I talked about earlier, a lot of those, uh, so again, I encourage everybody to take a photo. Um, these are resources that we have available. Everything you can go through, you can learn more about all of this.
or talk to me. If you have any questions, I am Iowa's cybersecurity advisor along with Jeff. I cover more Iowa than he does. He's primarily Nebraska, Kansas, uh, and I do more of Missouri and Iowa. Uh, and if you're across the river, you actually crossed over into Region 5. Mr. Tony Enriquez in Chicago, I include his contact up there as well. Uh, if you call any of us, uh, we can get you to the right person. Uh, also, this number at the bottom goes to the mothership in Arlington. Uh, they will push out. They will push out that information to uh, the right person as well.